So in this tutorial, we'll see how to predict the dynamics of a protein structure that we just obtained from the protein data bank by its temperature factor or the B value. So the temperature factor or the B value occupies the identifier 11 in the PDB file format, if you open that in the text format, and that just follows the occupancy uh, which lies in the identifier 10 of the PDB file. So these temperature factors or B factors basically designate for the movement of atoms, like the more the temperature factor in terms of their numbers, the more the movement of atoms in that region. And this is usually a result of the electron density maps that you see. The fuzzy regions are actually high in temperature factor. So we'll see if we can predict the dynamics of the protein, well, without running a molecular dynamics simulation uh, in reality, and just do a prediction of how much of a movement each of the atoms in residues might have just based on the temperature factor. So for this, we'll use the PDB file that we have already downloaded, which is the 3FFK, and that's the gelsilin actin complex, along with the water molecules and the calcium ions and uh, the ATP molecule together. We'll just go ahead and load the structure first. That's the PDB with the ID 3FFK. I have it downloaded already. So I go to File, New Molecule, and then browse and locate my structure so you can see i'm already inside my workspace one directory and i have this structure downloaded so i'm just going to highlight it and then open it and then load it so you can find that the default representation as we have seen earlier in the mod molecular modeling tutorials that uh, the default representation will either be a line representation or let's say a ball and stick representation which is a cpk representation in my case and also the screen. So the background is basically white in my case by default because I've changed some of the settings out here. But most of you will find a black background by default, which you can change by going to graphics and colors and then display and background and choose a color of your liking from here. All right. So the first thing that we'll do is represent the protein and the other entities like the metals, the water and the ATP separately. Okay. Like we, like, just like we did before, you know, with the aspartyl tRNA synthetase system. So we go to graphics again, we go to representation, and you might be aware that this protein is uh, having four chains, which is basically two different subunits belonging to a single asymmetric unit. So each of the subunits is actually a heterodimer of gelsilin and the actin protein together. Okay, so if we just type in protein here for the representation, and then we change the drawing method to new cartoon like we did before so you see all the uh, all the protein residues are represented in the cartoon format or in the ribbon format with the alpha helices and the beta sheets and the turns or the loop regions represented separately and then i'm just going to change the material just for just for the eyes you know so just going to pull this up a little bit and it's good to the eyes so i usually use this ao chalky format so it has a better representation, let's say, but it's again your personal choice, whatever you want to go for. And then I just change the coloring method to, let's say, chain. So you can clearly see the, all the chains together. So color differently. Basically, the gelsilin in this subunit, on the subunit on the left, is colored in blue, whereas the actin is colored in red, whereas the gelsilin and the actin on the second subunit on the right, which is basically chains D and E, are colored in black and orange respectively okay so what we don't need this color representation because we are going to color it separately according to the b value or the temperature factor so i just wanted to show you that it contains all the different chains so i'm just going to revert back to the name coloration out here and then we represent the rest of the entities in this pdb file which is firstly the calcium ions so i just type in rest name ca so ca is the residue id uh, the residue name for the calcium ions then i press enter and as you know it's just an atom to be precise so it can't be represented in the new cartoon format so we'll have to change the representation to a more uh, desirable format which is van der waals of vdw so if we click that then we'll see that uh, all the calcium ions are represented in the van der waals format so you can zoom in and have a look so in total there are 10 calcium ions, so 5 on each subunit. Next, we go for the water molecules. Once again, the water molecules, as I've told you before, in a PDB file, does not really have the hydrogen atoms 
attached to the oxygen. So it's difficult to resolve in an X-ray crystallography even the hydrogen atoms. So they basically have the oxygens in there. So if you type in water, you represent the water molecules and then press enter and we are already in the van der Waals representation and the coloring is done according to the name and for oxygen atoms the color is red out here that's by default from vmd okay and lastly the atp so we type in press name atp so these atp molecules are actually bound to the uh, actin chain which is chain B in this subunit and chain E in the other subunit. So as you can see, the representation is van der Waals here and doesn't really look good to the eye. So I'm just going to change it to licorice in order to distinguish them from the other entities. So change it to licorice representation and keep the coloring method as name. And we still find it like you can see it. You can kind of make out the difference out here. All right, so I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger to visualize properly. Another thing is a shortcut for suppose your molecule, like you have zoomed into it or you have translated it enough that your molecule is out of focus. So what you can do is on your keyboard, you can just type plus and it will bring the molecule back again uh, to the center of the screen, to center of the display. Okay. So now what we are going to do is we are going to change the coloring scheme for all of them, all of the representations that we have separately annotated here. So starting from the new cartoon representation of the protein, we'll change the coloring method to beta. So this beta coloring method actually stands for the B values. So it, it's the VMD has this capability or for that matter, all the molecular uh, visualization programs, Spymol and Chimera even, they have this capability to, you know, consider this identifier 11 from the PDB file and take the numbers or the values that corresponds to the atomic B value. So the atomic temperature factors are taken into consideration and based on that numbering, the coloring is done. We'll come back to the coloring in a minute, the coloring scheme. First, let me color all the other entities together. So next is the calcium ions and we change uh, the coloring method again to beta then for the water molecules, which are basically the oxygens, coloring method to beta again. And then finally, the ATP, coloring method to beta. Okay, so we have everything colored according to their B values. Now, the coloring scheme. So the coloring scheme here is basically red, white, and blue, which means red stands for the lower values of the B value or the temperature factor, whereas white stands for somewhere the middle grounds of the temperature factor, whereas blue color stands for the higher values of the p-value. So as you can see, the regions that are colored in red are actually less prone to fluctuations. That is, they are dynamically stable, let's say. And the regions that are colored to white are somewhere in the middle. And the regions that are colored in blue are highly fluctuating in nature. And right after looking at it, I mean, right at the first instant, you can make out that the regions that should be fluctuating more in nature that is they are not deeply colored in blue slightly lighter shade of blue which means that the structure is very very stable and it's not fluctuating so when you run a molecular dynamic simulation on the structure you'll find that the structure is very very stable because first of all this is a globular protein and secondly this has a lot of secondary structures in it like beta sheet and alpha helix so that makes it a lot lot stable than a structure let's say which has intrinsically disordered regions in it Okay, but now if we have a look at the specific regions which are colored in blue and the other regions which are colored in red, let's say we first look at the protein. So we are going to deselect or deactivate all the others because this is kind of a distraction with the uh, atomic representation of the calciums and the water molecules. So just deselect all of these together and just have the protein in view. And we see that the regions encompassing the surface or the interface between the gelsalin and the actin is highly, highly stable. So if you go back to the system, like the description of the system that you have on the slides, uh, it's mentioned there that, you know, the gelsalin and the actin complex can dissociate from each other by binding of a ligand to the gelsalin loop region, which is basically here. 
got this subunit as you can see this loop region out here so I'm gonna bring this more into focus so this guy so this is where the ligand lysophosphatidic acid or LPA binds to the gel um, monomer of a single subunit whereas the same you will find in in here okay so this is the this is the loop region where the lysophosphatidic acid ligand binds to this other subunit so and this is the whole molecule of genselin so two uh, structured regions connected by a loop region in between so the interface between these two the genselin and the actin these two interfaces or for that matter these two interfaces in the other subunit I don't know whether you can see it properly but I think you can now so these two interfaces are highly highly structured as it seems from their you know the coloring according to the B value which is red in nature especially the actin regions are very red in nature which means unless the ligand binds to this gelsalin binding site the PIP2 binding site of gelsalin the gelsalin and the actin complex will not separate from each other or not dissociate from each other and since this is not a ligand bound structure that is this is an APO structure which means the gelsalin and the actin complexes will stay together okay so this is like a proof of concept from the mechanistic point of view as well all right so apart from that you find these regions which are exposed to a solvent to be slightly fluctuating okay you have to keep in mind that the uh, beta values or the temperature factor usually ranges from 0 to 150 but if you go back to the pdb file in your text format you'll find that these values are actually uh, ranging up to a maximum of let's say 60 at the most not more than that so they lie somewhere in the middle that's why you don't find these highly well the high beta value regions the highest beta value regions to be you know that uh, bright a blue so which means they are fluctuating but not that much so these regions are susceptible to fluctuation or dynamicity because they are exposed to a solvent whereas these regions are also lying in the periphery so belonging to the gel saline. and in the other subunit you don't actually find that much of a fluctuating region so the fluctuating regions are mostly belonging to the gel saline subunit and the actin subunit is actually very very stable okay so let's turn this off the new cartoon representation and let's turn on the calcium ions so you see there are 10 calcium ions once again these bit 1 2 3 4 5 5 of them belong to the left subunit subunit 1 and the five others belong to the right subunit and you see that the left subunit calcium ions are less fluctuating than that of the right subunit and then if we turn on the water molecules for that matter and there's a lot of lot of water molecules but you can vaguely figure out particularly this subunit is slightly more fluctuating because of this blue atomic representations out here rather than this subunit so the water molecules some of these water molecules are also bound by the coordination state uh, with that of the calcium ions. So each of the calcium ion sites have a single water molecules attached to it. And lastly, the ATP. Honestly, I don't think you can find much of a difference by just looking at it. So these are very, very stable because first of all, they are bound to the actin protein. And secondly, they're also bound to another calcium ion on that site. All right, so that's that. And the next thing that we'll do is we'll try another uh, method to show the beta values, that is the fluctuating um, regions of the atoms or the residues in the uh, complex. So another way to do it is just go to extension and then you go to analysis and then you load the sequence field. So this is from the perspective of the amino acid sequences that are there or for that matter the metal ions and uh, the water molecules that lies in the sequence so if you click on it it will open the sequence view and just I'm going to turn back on the protein representation now so that you can compare and correlate with the colored p values so you see in the VMD sequence viewer you'll find all the sequences that are listed. So starting from gelsalin, which is at residue position 28, and until, so that's chain A, chain B, chain E, that's for the proteins. 
and then further down if you go down 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 and you have one ATP molecule and all the calcium ions also designated around here so all of these are represented by the color code of this column out here which is the B value so the B value here ranges from as I said before from 0 to 150 but you see most of the colors barely reaches up to the scale of let's say 75 even so after once it crosses 75 it would uh, go down towards the red uh, shades but it doesn't actually so most of them lies around the green shades out here so you see so within those green shades there are a few regions which are darker in shade as darker green in shade so initially the residue starting from 28 so that's the end terminal of the gel solid you'll find that it's slightly darker in shade which means those regions lie in the you know the uh, higher beta value regions so if you just click on one of these it can represent that particular residue in a licorice format and color them in yellow on your uh, on the viewer and if you further select this and drag along until let's say where the this ends out here you'll find all of those residues that are represented in licorice so that's great that's like another uh, validation check to see, just to see whether the annotations by the v-values the coloration by the v-values matches up with the coloration that we have with the sequences and they do so you find all these regions blue in color which means these are fluctuating in nature and that's why they have the shade of darker green on the sequence viewer okay so you can deactivate this by clicking anywhere else and now we look for any other region which is very very light in shade light shade of green let's say select the proper region so let's say this region out here I'm guessing this lighter shade of green will be highly structured and this will probably be buried inside somewhere around here and therefore they would be less fluctuating and the dynamicity would be restricted in that manner so let's go ahead and select that so you just left click and drag along and it will select the number of residues okay not bad so this is lying somewhere around this region uh, after all this was not a very light shade as we have expected so guessing by the shades of red out here imagining still a lighter shade of green would be available to a region corresponding to this out here which is darker in shade okay so you can correlate and make an assessment of the different regions that might be involved in binding as well so the more the fluctuating the region the more prone they are uh, to bind to a particular ligand or any small molecule that might come in its vicinity and this is also a check before running your molecular dynamic simulations just to see how strong hold of a structure your protein is so that once you run the simulation you can have the atomic fluctuations and compare them with the temperature factors in order to uh, reach to a strong inference or a conclusion. Thank you.